Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Street Dog Podcast. It's episode five. We're talking about remasters and how they demaster our experiences. What's going on, Dynamo? Hello, hello. And welcome to the HD version of the podcast. I yeah, guess. yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what I should have done? That's a missed opportunity because I should have just had like a bunch of lens flares all over the podcast. Oh, yeah, one yeah. Episode or something. Yeah. That's what they're going to do for the, I think, Mass Effect remaster. I think it was posted about some time ago. Where they, it's basically the same graphics, only with lens flares everywhere. Yes, I, so, I did hear about that. So obviously the most recent remaster to sort of grace the channel with its discussion piece was the Diablo 2 remaster. Uh, but the Mass Effect remaster is an interesting subject as well because that's obviously a bit more... I would actually say that even though Diablo 2 is an older game with more history and more people who would be like, quote unquote, nostalgic for it, Mass Effect was seminal in its own right, where the first Mass Effect game was like a lot of people's first foray into some sort of like science fiction world that was, quote unquote, interactive. It didn't end up being particularly good as a game. I don't know if you've ever played the original Mass Effect, Dynamo. Um, I played, the, I think, the first mission, and I stopped because after that you go into us. I, some sort of weird city where you just talk to people. Yes. And that's what I gave up, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it, it's it's kind of like a, a more, I guess, structured Deus Ex in a way, where it's not as free form as Deus Ex is, uh, but it still mm -hmm. has all of the elements. It still has the talking to people. It still has the progression through like some sort of, um, you know, uh, I would say level up system where you have like skills to assign and stuff. It has weapon modification, which I don't actually know if Deus Ex had, but there was some inventory management in that game. So, you know, there's, there's certain things that you can draw similarities to. And Mass Effect was basically like a higher definition uh, and again, more segmented Deus Ex where you had the yeah. experience of, of the role playing side of things. And it felt very start and stop with the actual gameplay. As you mentioned, you start off in a, some sort of cold open mission where you're just, like, there is a lot of talking to get into it, but then you get into the mission, uh, and then you go into even more talking on the Citadel. And that's the giant space flower planet that, or uh, space station thing that uh, apparently the, the lore behind that one is really funny, where it wasn't made by any one of these uh, species. It was actually just left behind by, like, some ancient technology or something. I don't fully remember, because they did go back uh, and retcon a bunch of stuff, uh, as every science fiction game, every game in general probably, uh, just seems to do with enough time. Every, even movies are doing this now with like the Alien franchise and stuff. So, whatever. Um, what I will say, though, is the Mass Effect remaster specifically is really funny because it's like so patently obvious that most people that I saw responding to it were like excited for the potential at best. Like the the best take, the, the most... Um, like optimistic take that I saw was basically people saying, oh, I'm really excited for the potential of uh, going in and and playing Mass Effect again with a higher resolution graphics or whatever. But look at all these fucking lens flares. Like, this is ridiculous. So even the people who are inclined to apologize, right, to be apologists for a game like Mass Effect, um, they, they were not happy either. And that kind of reaction you just don't see very much in the Blizzard space because this contrasts super well with Diablo 2 where most people seem to just be like, Blizzard is now releasing another product that they did not work on themselves. I am so excited to consume said product and buy all DLC. <laughs> like why, I, I don't know why people uh, come in and support this. So I guess before we jump into the specifics about the remaster uh, and some of the other work that Blizzard has obviously bungled in the past with remasters, I figured uh, we could talk about our histories with Diablo, and I guess notably your history, because you don't really have much. So you could just, I guess, yeah. restate what you were just telling me earlier before we started about it. Yeah, basically, I had a Diablo 1 disc when I was a kid, and I remember installing it one time, and it didn't work properly. I don't know, maybe my computer was just not uh, up to the task. This must have been, I don't know, like 2000, 2001. Right, it was yeah. a long time ago. Uh, and then I, I remember I played it again like a few years later, but the only thing I did was I just walked around town. I think there was a town. I think the game was top down in its perspective. Like, I don't think it was even isometric from what I remember. Oh, okay. And it had like this dark gothic theme. And I just remember like villagers standing around and then I just quit the game basically. Like, so that's my entire experience with the series. <laughs> so I may as well never have played it in my life. Yeah, fair enough. And th so that's the thing is like, Especially at the time when Diablo 2 specifically came out, I had only ever played uh, StarCraft from Blizzard. So I wasn't really sure what to expect. I did see when 
this is back in the day when you would install a, a disc and then on the, the launcher for the installer, there would be like a teaser for other games coming out from the same company. And so yeah. I actually went through and I would, I would watch some of the stuff just to see what else was going on. Uh, as, a, as, as a kid, I was interested in what other games were being made. And obviously I enjoyed StarCraft. So when I was reinstalling it for the umpteenth time, because like, uh, oh, it's a different computer or whatever. Uh, I noticed oh, wait. that there was... That actually oh, reminds yeah. me, I, I did actually own Diablo 2. And I actually attempted to install it. I remember this now because I remember it came in three discs for whatever reason. And uh, I was not just never able to install it. it always crash at the installer. So I don't know if I got a defective copy or whatever. But I remember mm. trying to install it multiple times. Since it was by Blizzard, I thought it was going to be an RTS game. I didn't really yeah, research yeah. games much back then. And I just failed completely. So I never got to experience it for that reason. That that is kind of the thing too is that I mean it was Diablo two definitely had that isometric perspective where you're controlling a unit at least so there's probably been some lunatic out there on the internet that has tried to redefine Diablo two as a real time strategy game because it's real time top down <laughs> controlling one yeah, guy. yeah. I, I guess when you play that. as the the undead guy the necromancer or whatever when you play as N you can raise an army of units so yeah it's basically an RTS. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably more of an RTS than some other actual RTS games, as a matter of fact. So it wouldn't even surprise me if that was a, a way that some people did that. Um, so yeah, my experience with the game was mostly just like seeing the trailer that was included with uh, the StarCraft installer. And I was pretty interested in like what that could even mean, because I didn't know that Blizzard was disproportionately focused on medieval stuff. StarCraft is their only science fiction IP, believe it or not. Um, I think maybe they have, they might have had like some sort of really old one uh, it, like that that just never went anywhere um, from a long time ago, like one of their side scrolling games. But for the like in terms of the games that everybody knows them for, it's the franchises are like Overwatch, which I guess you could consider sci fi. Not really. It's like just slight future uh, and anime. And then there's uh, obviously they've got Warcraft and Starcraft and Diablo. And those are the main ones. So. For them to have focused so heavily on medieval stuff and fantasy stuff without me actually knowing, I thought that was kind of interesting at the time. And then eventually I actually had to go and play it, of course. And that obviously made some changes. So I think when I sat down to play Diablo 2, I there was no way I could have possibly understood what the appeal was because the genre, admittedly, is not for me. However, when Diablo 2's remaster is announced and everybody gets excited for it, I can still put myself in the shoes of people who did enjoy that title, and I can recognize that through my own very limited forays into the genre, which might actually reflect some of the people who played Diablo 2 but then haven't played very many games, you know, after they, you know, they say, quote unquote, they grow up and then they grow out of games or whatever, um, yeah. That is a situation where I think most people, like I could actually relate to most people there because there is nothing really like Diablo 2, even though it's not really a game that I would want to play. The, the successor to it, the spiritual successor is obviously Path of Exile. And Path of Exile itself is obviously like, if you've ever seen it or if you've ever played it, you know it's like a grindy uh, looter. No, I have no idea what this game is like. I think it's similar to Diablo, Diablo 3 specifically from what I heard. Well, it's it's funny but, because uh, most of the time the people who are are big fans of of Diablo or of Path of Exile say that it's the it's the best parts of Diablo two and it's it's not Diablo three, which is its own like hilarity. Obviously, um, the the main I issue don't, is I it. do know that there are some Diablo clones from back in the day, like from the late nineties and early two thousands. I remember I think Cohen was one such game, but I'm sure there are others as well. Basically, many companies try to capitalize on its success the same way that many companies try to copy command and conquer and Starcraft, right like that, that's the that was the attempt but i don't know how, many, how successful some of those games were i haven't played them so i, I only saw them like on mobby games and other listings like that but yeah like I, I imagine like part of exile is the primary successor in the modern age essentially like in yes uh, post 2010s basically so the yeah that, that is the major element too is that basically um there is because there hasn't been a game like diablo 2 released in literally forever when a game comes out and it has elements of that flavors of that there's a a niche to be filled there there's a market to be served and that's essentially what path of exile has done for a long time 
Um, th that's actually one of the main reasons why Diablo 3, even though it, I believe it's on that same list that we were looking at earlier uh, for the previous episode of this podcast where we talked about GTA 5, the list of highest grossing games of all time. I think Diablo 3 is actually in like the top 20 or something, uh, which is kind of despicable considering how <laughs> vapid that particular product actually is. But yeah, the... The thing is, I think a lot of consumers ended up buying Diablo 3 and then not being satisfied with it. And there's much less buyer's remorse into a free-to-play game, even if you end up purchasing microtransactions. Be and th that's exactly what Path of Exile is. It's fr free-to-play. You install it. There's the MTX shop that you, uh, you get advertised at a few times. Uh, plenty of times, actually, when you're booting up the game and stuff. Uh, but to the credit of the developers, uh, Gas Powered Games, I believe, they have, well, it's either that or it's grinding gear games. I can never get it right, but it's some GGG fucking three. So these guys, this development firm have uh, actually made the game run better, more be more performant over time and are moving things over to a new engine while they continue to update the old one with additional content. So it's actually like, it's basically what you would want out of a developer in yeah. theory. Like obviously they're, they're pushing microtransactions, but aside from their shitty monetization, the fact that they're um, making the game, making their product more performant, even if I don't like the product and it's not my kind of thing, it's not a genre for me, and I think it's just pointless grind a lot of the time, they are still a generally positive force in the industry from what I've seen. I will caveat that. Maybe there's some shit that I don't know. Um, that being said, as, a, as an outside observer, Path of Exile is already a very solid competitor to something like a Diablo 2 remaster or to a Diablo 3, in fact, or a Diablo 4, as was announced a while back when um, Blizzard had that, that uh, insane uh, rush job on their Diablo 4 sort of announcement because of the whole fiasco with Hong Kong and, uh, and the... the Blitzchung and the mobile and game as well. Yeah, 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 and the, and the mobile game. So there's a lot of things that rolled into one there, uh, where where obviously Diablo Four was fast tracked to announcement stage without actually being ready to be announced because as we've seen since then, it's years away still. So uh, and that was already years ago, but now so it's just more tactics that Blizzard try to employ to get people uh, to sweep shit under the rug. There was the old adage back in the day, and I don't, I haven't kept up on this. So maybe it's continued to happen for a while. You'll like this one. They were just announcing that overwatch characters were gay. And that was the way to, to have pop positive headlines <laughs> instead of like whatever shit was like going down <laughs> on social media. So they'd like, Oh yeah. Soldier 76 is gay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess so. So it like that that's basically what they would use to get t Twitter on their side for the day and then like people would probably forget because nobody seems to pay attention to any of this shit for very long. That's the same sort of thing. Pandering, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that's that's pretty much the same thing. Like obviously it's pandering because if they really gave a shit about human rights stuff, uh, they wouldn't be talking about gay characters. They would they would make one character stand up for Hong Kong in the game. That's what they would do and yeah, they'll never exactly. do that. So. In fact, I remember that one of the um... During the Hong Kong protests, I think some people were trying to make one of the Overwatch characters into a Hong Kong Defender icon, but it was an entirely like uh, fan-driven initiative. I don't think it worked out in the end. It's not something that Blizzard ever attempted to do, naturally. And uh, yeah, I think it died off after a while. Yes. It just shows that Overwatch is just a... It's basically not the place you want to be if you want to care about human rights i guess yeah and that's the that's the truth for all of blizzard's roster of games to be honest it's anything that that company really touches right and by extension activision a lot of companies are complicit in the whole like chinese uh money thing where they oh yeah, have a disproportionate yeah. not just game money. companies either obviously oh yeah yeah sure so uh, i think uh, like just as a brief aside uh, some months ago i don't remember when exactly there was basically um an initiative in the united states congress uh, to basically make a bill against the forced exploitation that's going on in uh, mm. Xinjiang, or also known as East Turkestan. It's basically where the Uyghur genocide is happening. Yes, yeah, yeah. And basically a lot of American companies protest at this move because they have a lot of uh, you know workshops in that region, and they're basically taking advantage of the forced labor, so they oppose the bill. Yep. So that tells you about the level of care that these companies have for human rights. Well, that's the other thing. I mean, that 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 can bring us into a complete different discussion too about how like we all anybody who gets a like builds a computer or orders a computer or gets a replacement part or anything like that. They're like in a way you're 
I wouldn't say profiting off of, but enjoying the fruits of like yeah. completely unmarked labor where you don't like, there's not like a, there's, there's not an HR department for the, the people over at um, Foxconn, for example, that yeah, are handling exactly. Apple. Like all the exploitation at, at Foxconn or, or even like in uh, Congo, for example, like between Foxconn and Congo. Yeah. Yeah. And, the blood diamond stuff. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of stuff that obviously goes on daily, but, it's not like we as a regular individuals can do anything to yes, stop it. Yeah. We should obviously expect governments and people to behave better. But when you get situations like the Blizzard Hong Kong story, which really is small peanuts, if you think about yep. it. It, was, it wasn't exactly like... They were not the driving force between behind the oppression in Hong Kong, right? Of course, yeah. But when they still behave this way, you see that the problem is so deeply rooted that even something as simple as this isn't easily tackled. Yeah, and that was going to be my next sort of follow-up point on that, is that there's these massive things that feel unimaginably difficult to for any one person to involve themselves in, and it's like massive scale, it's literally dealing with like the oppression of an entire people, uh, but then there's one game where at the end of a, a professional match of, I think it was, yeah, it was Hearthstone, is literally Hearthstone, it was, it, I don't know why that's so funny to me because it's just like not a game I would think of as like a particularly competitive discipline. But okay, at the game end of a game of Hearthstone, a single player stands up and says, "Free Hong Kong, uh, battle in our time," or something like, or "Rebellion in our time." There was some some slogan that was associated with that Hong Kong rebellion. Revolution of our time. Revolution of our time. Yeah. So basically, he says that he has he has that to say. I think he says it in his native language instead of in English, but that's what it translates to, and. They not only fire and fine this guy and dock him of all of his prize money for winning the event, but or winning his matches, uh, but they also fire the casters who did nothing. They <laughs> they fire those guys and they're Jesus like blacklisted Christ. from the fucking industry. So the Hearthstone casters, which again I'm gonna try to not laugh too much at the term Hearthstone caster or Hearthstone competitor, but these guys like okay, this is your esport, like this is your game, and then you're just gonna fire people because <laughs> because they said. Like they they were on the same broadcast as somebody else who said something like what yeah the they fuck? didn't stop them harshly enough they didn't <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The they didn't stand up and disavow and say say that China is indeed uh, the the true owner and operator of Taiwan and Hong Kong yeah that's that's what would have needed to happen so just the fact that Blizzard took like caved and and took that knee and then obviously all of the insane PR shit that happened afterwards if you somehow missed this story basically the leads at Blizzard like the big big dogs i can't remember if it was Bobby Kotick or if it was somebody else but i'm pretty sure it was him made this PR sort of response it it's just straight legal speak basically it's just straight corporate PR talk and you get no personality. You get no acknowledgement of like something wrong or something fishy. You just get a straight up like deflection, basically, of like, oh, this is uh, how it is. This is like um, we, we value. We here at Blizzard value all of our different voices and you know shit like that. Uh, and there were walkouts in the company and stuff. Like again, like you said, Dynamo, this is small shit at the end of the day. This is not like a massive. Like this isn't massive human exploitation. This is literally just somebody. S- like saying, "Hey, I'm from Hong Kong, and I want to talk about my with the struggle my people are going through," and that's what Blitzstrung did. And okay, now he's like fine. Then there's this big public backlash. Like this is not what you really should be getting up in arms about. To be honest, you should be getting up in arms about the fact that it's like the the Uyghur stuff that you mentioned. You should be getting up in arms about all the other exploitation if you're going to get up in arms about anything. And yeah. this is, this is like my major issue with anybody who who comes in and says I'm excited for a Blizzard product. Like maybe it's just me being like expecting too much from people, but surely you guys can have some sort of situation where you you realize a come to Jesus moment where you realize, Hey, I shouldn't be sitting here. Like just desperate to have a game to play or a a recycled version that runs worse of a, of a game that I used to play years ago. Um, I, I shouldn't be wanting that and, and supporting that financially uh, from a company that is as scummy as Blizzard. Like, I'm just waiting for that, for that moment for these people. That would be nice to, to get something like that. So, yeah. That, that's and the Hong Kong issue. stuff was really the beginning of, um, I want to say the end, although that's not really accurate. But basically, I think it was, like you said, the come to Jesus moment for yeah. many people. Yeah, yeah. Many people that saw Blizzard as being this invincible company that's not built like the other companies and the products are something else that you don't get elsewhere in the industry. When they saw, First of all, I think it was... I don't remember what came first. The Diablo Immortal uh, like fiasco 
or the Hong Kong one. Either way, these two events together, they really destroy the fate that many people had in Blizzard, which is not something I would have expected to see years ago, but it really made a big impact. And uh, I guess in itself, it also casts a long shadow of the over Warcraft 3 Reforge. As uh, I remember many people were doing mock-ups of uh, the Tiananmen Square like tank uh, picture, the famous one, right? Using the Warcraft 3 engine where they had like, a bunch of those uh, human uh, anti-building tanks with a peasant in front of them. And uh, you know, when the when the game was uh, re- actually released, when the remaster was actually released, many of them just said, "Well, I guess you were too busy defending um, your shitty practices and not in, not busy enough to do a functioning product when it comes to co- when it comes to this remaster." Yeah. So basically, time wise, like uh, on a timeline, uh, like in the timeline, that's really the moment where uh, I think many people started to realize just how little effort. Blizzard was putting into the remasters and games yes, at that yeah. point. Well, in a video that I made somewhat recently when this Diablo 2 stuff went out, I did a Crow Pill episode on the remaster and, and how the title is Blizzard Have Learned Nothing. Um, the, the hidden meaning behind that is that they, they'll never really learn anything because they're not forced to by like the consumers who pay for their content. So that's kind of the, the little dig there. But the, the other component with the Diablo 2 stuff and with how it's come out is that it, it is exactly like you're saying about the, how little effort there is. But the problem is that like even though there's a small little erosion of mind share every time Blizzard fuck up and there is that small amount of people who do have the the sort of, like we keep saying the come to Jesus moment like that the awakening like oh shit like Blizzard have uh, been fucking us around for quite a while now. Uh, this is pretty messed up. Like even though that happens, even though that is the case, you still get these elements, I think, where you you have so many reasons. If you just want to open your eyes, you have so many reasons to not buy a Blizzard product. And this is before you even think about the product that they are about to release. For one, they have not developed a, a, a game since Overwatch. Everything else has been a World of Warcraft expansion, I think a Diablo 3 expansion in the time since Overwatch, uh, and then obviously the remasters. That's been it. So they haven't made a new game, uh, and maybe they don't need to. Maybe that's just not their business model. But they don't have anything that proves to you that they're a competent development firm. They have everything that proves the opposite. Uh, They have the fact that they are, uh, for one, merged with Activision in the first place. People like to talk about this as when Blizzard died. Obviously, we, we seem to know that that's not the case, that they were already pretty stupid well before that. But... The fact that they made the decision to do that in the first place showed pretty clearly that at the the time, Activision was a leader because of recycling the same game over and over again with Call of Duty. So when Blizzard merges with a company like that, it kind of tells you what's going on. And this is after World of Warcraft. This is after all of the predatory monetization schemes. So depending on how far back you want to go for it, it's literally any point in Blizzard's history, I would say after 1997, maybe a little bit earlier, um, at any point in Blizzard's history, you can look at what they're doing and say, yeah, you shouldn't be doing this. And then the more you stack on all of these things that are ill-advised or something that is like unethical or uh, just not something that you should be doing in terms of trying to deliver a high-quality product, forget about ethics. Just think about like the quality of the work that they don't do. That is really all the argumentation a consumer should need. These guys don't produce quality products. They haven't for years. Let's uh, go take our money elsewhere. There's the larger problem of there not being that much of an alternative. But that's not the case with Diablo 2's remaster, as we just discussed with Path of Exile. Path of Exile seems to be the de facto Diablo clone or replacement or spiritual successor. It's been like that for quite a few years now. And they seem to be, as a development firm behind it, seem to be uh, going quite a, a good direction where they do try to make the game run better. They do try to add more content and move it. they're moving it to a new engine, which in theory will have them be even less limited than what they can do and even more performant ideally. So there's all these things that point to going elsewhere and taking your time elsewhere, because in this case, it's not even money because it's free. So yeah, I I don't see the point at this point in, in buying a Blizzard product. I haven't saw it in a while, but if you're specifically interested in Diablo 2, it doesn't make any sense to go for something other than Path of Exile. If this is your game, if this is a market that you're interested in. If this is yeah, a if genre that you're interested in. Favorite type of game, exactly. Yeah. There's there's other content out there that isn't made by, seeming, well, to, to our knowledge anyway, is not made by scumfuck companies. 
uh, that have a controlling interest in, in the Chinese market and stuff and are uh, essentially profiting off of straight up like ridiculous levels of corruption and oppression. Uh, that, that would be ideal. It would be ideal to not uh, support a company that does all of these ethical things, just like it would be ideal to not support a company that gives you low quality products. The other thing is that I would be a little bit more lenient on the fan reaction. I wouldn't really think that it was good or right or just, but I would understand it at the very least. If people who are buying Blizzard products bought them because they were high quality and just sort of like blacked out the parts where like, oh, Blizzard does like, uh, is exposed for like, obviously siding with China over Hong Kong and in, in human rights violations. Because at least like you can just, crit you can criticize their approach ethically or whatever, but as a consumer, they're not like, contributing to the downfall of the industry by buying shitty products and supporting shitty business practices. So they're at least pur purchasing high quality products at that point. And the least you can say that about them. You can't say that about them though, because Blizzard hasn't yeah. made a high quality product. So that's, that's really kind of where we sit. And I suppose this is going to be where we spiral out to talk about remastering as a concept. Other remasters Blizzard has done other remasters. Other people have done like basically wherever you want to go with this, because we don't, we neither of us have an exhaustive amount of experience with Diablo. It's not really our franchise or genre. Uh, but I think we've, we've more or less covered why it's ill-advised to bother with this particular remaster from Blizzard. And then we, we can talk a little bit about maybe some other ones to watch out for as well. Well, one more thing I want to add about Diablo sure. and Blizzard Remasters in general is that, first of all, Blizzard as a company has a long history of hiring external companies to make the games. This has been a thing yes. ever since Warcraft 2, in fact, where they actually hired another company to do the expansion pack. And the same is true for uh, uh, Brood War. Yep. I don't know about the Diablo 2 expansion, actually. I, I don't know if they did that internally or they hired someone else. But basically, all of the remasters have been done through hiring uh, other studios. I think it was Lemon Sky Studios for StarCraft Remastered, and I don't know who was behind Reforged. Maybe it was a bunch of studios. But either way, for Diablo 2 Remastered, or Diablo 2 Resurrected, I think it's called, they basically hired the Vicarious Visions, I think, is the name of the company. Yes. Which is, um, I think they're the, the ones behind the new Crash games, if I'm not mistaken. Basically, they're a bit of a less... Uh, they're, they're less of a no-name studio, so to speak. So maybe this remaster is going to be better just because someone with more like experience is going to take care of it. But again, I would be very skeptical about it. And even then, just wait and see, basically. Don't just pre-order it blindly just because it's Blizzard. Don't just, you know, charge into it with uh, the expectation that it's going to bring, bring your childhood back. Just wait and see, basically, especially after Reforged. Right? Like, yeah, I think especially. that's just common sense at this point. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, regarding other remasters, I think a point I brought up earlier before the podcast was started is that Blizzard actually skipped some of the games. So, yeah. for example, the first one they did was StarCraft, which I guess they did uh, exclusively to try and capitalize on the still existent uh, Korean PvP scene, from what I understand. And you've said that the only reason it's played is because it allows to play the game at a higher resolution, so you can see more of the map uh, at any given time, which could definitely prove to be advantages during uh, a match, right? Even if the graphics are completely fucking unreadable. Yeah. But uh, other than that, um, I think most of the other remasters, for example, they have not touched any of their early games, like like I said. Like, I don't think they touched uh, Lost Vikings or uh, uh, Rock and Roll Racing or even Warcraft 1 and 2, for example. They, they just completely skipped over those and they actually went to remake Warcraft 3 instead. And when you think about it, considering, for example, how primitive Warcraft 1 is as a game, I would argue that that's actually a game that would benefit from a remaster far more than Warcraft 3 would. Even if Warcraft 3 is a disaster, it's still a modern game which has like hotkeys and uh, more or less all the control and stuff you expect to see from a game that uh, basically came out fairly recently. So I don't really, I don't really see why they just skip those games. I think they would benefit from Mario Master much more than Warcraft 3 would. So it's really strange to me that they decided to do that. Whereas other companies, for example, like Ensemble Studios, in this case Microsoft, or uh, Electronic Arts, for the case of Westwood Studios, they actually started the remasters of, of Age of Empires 1 and Command and & Conquer 1 from the first game. They didn't skip them over. They decided to do the remaster treatment for them with varying results. 
And at least in the case of Command and & Conquer and Red Alert 1, which have been made freeware a while ago, they actually were made open source as well, which I think is a very good thing and hopefully something that is done more for other remasters. And obviously not something that Blizzard has done, for example. Yeah, They did make the, the first StarCraft free, whereas I don't think they did the same for Diablo 2 and Warcraft 3. No, so at least you have they to pay that. for the whole product, I'm pretty sure, in that case, yeah. They did that, which is good, but they should have made the game open source, which unfortunately they didn't. So even in that sense, like I think you can clearly see how Blizzard is really behind in the thriving remaster market that you're seeing these days. Yeah, a lot they of it is short-sightedness. We, I mean, we kind of touched on this in the previous episode, too, talking about how like y- you want to allow for content to be made for your game without you even needing to develop all the content yourself when we were talking about Rockstar and how they're very stringent with their shit, um, but, but they don't really offer... like You essentially have to write server plugins and hackneyed reverse-engineered shit in order to improve the game's performance, in order to allow for like basic customization options for multiplayer and racing and stuff. So the fact that like you can't do something like that so easily reduces the longevity of your game. And obviously the fact that custom content will just break every so often when there's an update to the game is another really big sticking point for a lot of people. Um, just earlier today, in fact, on the Discord server, we were discussing how StarCraft II, a lot of the custom content can't even be played anymore. And that's not even something where they've done anything other than use the very editor that shipped with the game. In Remastered, you can at least argue that, oh, StarCraft One Remaster, you're modding, you're using some third-party software that's actually a breach of the EULA because you're bypassing the anti-cheat. So, okay, there's some some justification there. Maybe you can't expect the company to facilitate that. It's still a terrible platform uh, for custom content in that respect because as soon as you're done working within the product, your mod has a a shelf life, basically. It has a a timed life, and it will expire at some point unless you're there to continue updating it. Or, worst case scenario, the guy who's updating the tool that allows you to update your mod stops updating his tool. (laughs) Then you're really fucked, and everything's fucked. Um, So everything has a a built-in timed life associated with it on that platform, and really it will, at the end of the day, just end up being a flash in the pan, unless Blizzard just stops updating, which seems unlikely based on the track record they've given. So I would say, though, that it's worth mentioning that they actually never made it any easy or convenient for mods to thrive on StarCraft 2, for example. Like, I remember from the very beginning of the game, they even the fact that they had, for example, really fucked up menus that couldn't yep. allow you to launch a custom campaign very easily, you just had to go to the editor and use the test function to actually play it, which in itself is really insane to me. Yes. Like how, how hard is it to program a fucking menu? Like, StarCraft Brood War has that. It's not like it's rocket science. So yeah. I think that just really shows that they they never gave a shit about it. They just, uh, even though it was part of like the marketing for it, I remember StarCraft Two modding being uh, highly advertised back then, and uh, yes. many people were uh, hoping that it would allow them to do projects of a scale never seen before. But it was all disappointments in the end. The other because thing there was, too, there yeah. was never the intention from Blizzard to actually make something good out of it. They were just basically scamming people, I want to say. Well, the other thing, too, is that they advertised a map marketplace, if you remember, where you could pay for maps. And eventually that happened where there were premium maps, which is disgusting. But uh, yeah. like it, it t- calls into question. It's like the Skyrim horse armor mod shit for money and stuff. The paid mods on Steam that lasted for like an hour or whatever. Like a, I think it was like a week um, before it got pulled down. And that's just like, obviously, that's never going to work. But... When you consider the opp- opportunity to like really do like make a push to facilitate custom content, it's something that Blizzard has kind of dined out on because of the fact that Dota came from Warcraft Three. Uh, th- the fact that you could trace its lineage all the way to a StarCraft One custom map makes it seem like their their games are more mod friendly or more. Uh, custom content friendly than they really are is as everybody yeah. knows from watching my work it is not friendly to work within brood war if you want to Absolutely. do anything other than like the basic shit from the engine or the editor or even worker three because you have experience yeah. with that as well oh yeah 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 well there's a ton of hard-coded shit and there's no there's not even reverse engineering pushes uh, that are very public anyway for Warcraft 3. Uh, maybe there's been a little bit more interest from some of the Russians who enjoy playing on the older versions because obviously Reforged is such a, a dumpster fire. Um, and it, were I not already working on my own engine, uh, that might even be an interesting side thing to get into every now and then and work on some content there uh, in a, a version that's like a, a frozen version of Warcraft
StarCraft 3 or something. But in StarCraft 2, like, you're not even modding. You're not even breaking the EULA. You're literally making a map using the editor that they provide out of the box for the game. And it just breaks. Their own single-player content for the official campaigns will break from an update and have to be fixed. And, like... People have, have run cover for them. People have said, oh, it's just a big you know code base or whatever. Like It's hard to change one thing here without changing another thing there. That's how you know that people are just apologists because if you program with any degree of, of uh, ethics to your programming, so to speak, there's like a term called programming ethics, like coding ethics. If you if you program well, that doesn't happen because you've yeah. essentially like inlined a bunch of shit basically and made it so that there's a ton of stuff where it, like, it shouldn't be. Like changing one thing shouldn't change another thing. However, that's something we see historically in really big obvious problems with world of warcraft there was a really old one years and years probably over a decade now uh where people were getting uh, some sort of debuff uh plague a blood plague or something on them and it wasn't killing them until they left the uh the area and then when they died it would spread to other people or something to that effect and somehow somehow there was some transition or transmission there and it essentially was wiping people for like on respawn. Essentially, they wouldn't, the fuck? they couldn't, they couldn't play the game for like I would say upwards of a couple of days, maybe a week, uh, and stuff. That's basically just the fact that uh, like Blizzard fucked something up on the code base level, and their excuse was, well, we changed something. It shouldn't have changed that. It did, and that's all you really need to know. Like that, something like that that can literally, you know, stop paying customers from experiencing their subscription based fucking game, <laughs> like. It's even more egregious when you're you're paying for every month that you play, uh, as opposed to just paying once to own the game. So, yeah, there, there's a long history of Blizzard fucking things up on a technical level. The fact that they've ne- then outsourced their work to companies that also fuck things up on a technical level is not really surprising, uh, which is sort of what we had hinted at earlier when uh, talking about Lemon Sky. Uh, however, Lemon Sky, maybe this, this is a, an opportunity for me to check in with you about the CNC1 remasters. So many, like, I guess it's been a, a year or two now. Um, Mm -hmm. what's been, I don't know if you've really paid that much attention to it, but have, have the new graphics been received? Well, have it, has it been a different look than, um, the blizzard ones? Because obviously lemon sky studios also did that one, if I'm not mistaken. So it it would be interesting to contrast that with the starcraft and warcraft three remasters. Well, the command and conquer remaster, like you said, was done by the same company. Um, I would say that the art style is somewhat similar, but there is the advantage that the graphics for the original command and conquer game as much are much more simplistic. So, there's basically way less of a um, chance for them to fuck it up. Let let me post, for example, a screenshot here just so you can see. I don't really like it, I have to say. I think, for ex- especially the tanks look like they're made out of Lego pieces. Yes, yeah. But I would say it's significantly less uh, terrible than the StarCraft stuff. Like It's a lot more clean, I would say. It still looks pretty dumb, but uh, I don't know. I don't think it's quite as much of a disaster as the StarCraft Remastered it, was. Yeah, it looks stylized and cartoony a little bit, but it it is, re- uh, well, at least I hope in, in motion as well. It's a bit more readable by the looks of things. It does not It does yeah. look a little bit like a mobile RTS knockoff of yeah. Red Alert, unfortunately. Uh, but at the very least, I can, like, I can understand what a unit looks like or what a unit is. Yeah, uh, if I, if you recall, I posted uh, a few screenshots on the Special Boss channel a few days ago, or maybe it was last week actually, where I basically showcased some of the graphics from the Sarkap Remaster, and I, I put two Zerg buildings next to each other, yeah. basically, and they look like they come from completely different games. Let me actually pull it up. I should have it here. There we go. Like, look at this. This literally looks like it was made for two different games and just slapped together as part of a Korean mod or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So compared yeah. to this, well, for example, you can see how the sunken colony doesn't even look like it has a shadow or whatever. Yeah, it's like, it just bright. looks like it's yeah. passed in, like, in MS Paint or whatever. And whereas the other building is bloody as fuck for whatever reason. It's just the team so, color yeah. and the the lack of contrast between that and the uh, the building itself. Yeah, it's so yeah. I would say graphically, like the new graphics for uh, Command and Conquer Remaster have a they're definitely a big step up from StarCraft. But mm. I'm not personally a big fan either way. They, so if they do the make like the other game, like it looks like a coherent yeah. single style. 
even though it's not yeah, something that I agree with stylistically speaking. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It just looks kind of like you said, kind of like a mobile game, kind of like Lego in a way. Like yeah. if you see the blue tanks, especially, yeah. they look like they're made out of Lego bricks to me. Yeah, what, what really got me was whatever that structure is at the end, uh, the big structure on the other side of the bridge uh, below the Tesla coil. Uh, I think that's the MCV deployed. Yeah, that's the construction. <laughs> yeah. Yet. So. That one, that one does look like straight up like a, a kid's like a, it looks like a, a prop in Wreck It Ralph or something <laughs> like some kids yeah. movie. So yeah, uh, and then obviously Personally, the Barracks looks very. I, I don't hate Lemon Sky Studios or anything, but I hope they don't get hired to make a or two on Slash Tiberian Sound Remaster if those end up happening. I hope they will get another company to do it. I think graphically, uh, a more a much more successful remaster has been the Age of Empires two one. Well, right, yeah. they actually, I think, nailed the art style pretty well, and the higher resolution graphics look pretty nice overall. Much better than the first one as well. But the, let's say the animations were completely fucked. Yes, just to yep. put it lightly. Lot, but lot of the problems. Age of Empires two definitive edition, even though like the crumbling animations are pretty silly, and uh, I don't really don't like what they did with the fire and smoke effects when it comes to those. Other, otherwise, I think it's probably by far the best looking of all these remasters. And it's also still a 2D game, whereas from my understanding, for example, Diablo 2 Resurrected is going to switch to 3D graphics, if I understood correctly. Yes, character. according to this article that we'll have linked in the description along with the images that we were just discussing, there's a uh, essentially some information that it will be a new, th- quote-unquote, new 3D graphics engine. Um talking about how its gameplay will be identical to the original version and allow uh, players to switch between the new and classic graphics, which I don't know if it was a feature of the Warcraft 3 Reforged because I've never installed that, but I do know it was a feature in StarCraft Remaster. You just hit a uh, hockey on your keyboard uh, to switch between the standard definition and the remastered uh, skin pack. So at that point, in theory, there's not really a whole lot that's stopping you from experiencing it in the old style, but I do have my doubts that the gameplay will be identical. I find it very unlikely, especially given that this is just uh, some studio, like that's not Blizzard themselves. I find it very unlikely that they'll be able to remain one-to-one faithful with like a literal engine switch. And that that's probably the most puzzling thing. However, I understand why. Notoriously, Diablo 2 is one of the most fucked code bases to work with for any Blizzard dev. And even if they do have the source code, which I best I would bet that they do, it would still requ- essentially require reverse engineering because the people who wrote the code didn't fucking document it and didn't know really what they were doing in the first place and have long since moved on from the company. Uh, odds are anyway. So in that's in such a situation, it doesn't really make sense to consider uh, working on the the old engine, so to speak, uh, working within the the old confines. Uh, I imagine it was even more difficult, uh, it would have been significantly more difficult to to add in every bit of functionality they wanted um, if they were going to go the way of like similar to StarCraft Remaster where they have in, they're just hacking in Chromium and stuff. The one thing that we can say is hopefully the engine actually performs better because it is something that is presumably tailored for this experience. The problem is we've already seen frame drops in the re- the official trailer recordings of their fucking their announcement trailer has tr- frame drops in it. There obviously the, like since then there's been additional gameplay and it doesn't look like performance is consistent whatsoever. You can make an argument that maybe that's just early early days stuff. I still don't think you should be releasing content uh releasing promotional material until everything is like taken care of and I also think that sort of like um there's a there's an old adage from back in the day where you'd get a, a demo for a game and you'd be able to install it from like say Xbox Live on your console or just like a, a I guess Steam demos like PC demos probably weren't as common but console demos were a dime a dozen back in the day especially for multiplayer betas and stuff by the time it hits beta or demo it's final there is no changes there, like there's not going to be significant sweeping changes to be made we saw this with StarCraft 2 itself actually when the beta shipped a lot of the things that uh then later on went to become defining for Wings of Liberty, like the Infestor being fucked up and stuff. Like all that shit was pretty similar. There weren't really that many changes. And that's something that I would expect to be the case here, even though it might be called alpha gameplay. It might be called like, you know, a teaser or some like promotional thing. Um, They are promoting and teasing content that doesn't perform well. I think at this point, it's probably a little too late to attempt to uh, run cover for that. I don't think it's going to be changed. I'll put it to you that way. I think odds are at this point, the 
content you're seeing in these trailers is probably about, about as well as it's going to perform. I guess there's an outside chance that they're recording below system requirements, but that's another thing that we should probably talk about is the bloat that happens with these remasters where they do become significantly more hungry for system memory and GPU and stuff like this, where before they weren't, obviously. Um, it's maybe unrealistic to expect that they preserve the exact identical one-to-one -one system requirements. Uh, I don't know to what extent that would be, like how difficult that would actually be. Uh, but I do know that it's, next to impossible to have a performance remaster these days. People are having difficulty with, uh, admittedly sparse difficulty with Age of Empires 2. Uh, I would say for the most part, that one probably performs fine. Uh, however, all of the Blizzard ones have performed like absolute shit. Um, and of course, uh, the original games themselves are not very performant. You just can't tell because at the scale you're playing, it's usually not that big of a deal. Uh, for example, StarCraft has really bad performance issues if you have like a significant number of units above the in-game unit limit. So they never had to worry about that in their version, but they didn't program it very well for, for scalability, we'll say. And that is true for all of the other content as well. Warcraft 3, if you do take advantage of the 24 player limit that they added in a patch uh, and you have tw uh, 23 AI running and it's a one, like uh, a, not a one versus 23, but a, you're, you're playing or observing a 24 player match with AI, you hit the one FPS mark pretty early on, just like Starcraft two with uh, yeah. eight AI on a map. So it, it's pretty, um, yeah, it's, it, it's obviously not going to be like solvable on that side. They haven't been able to solve it even for a game like Warcraft three, which presumably has more active players than Diablo two would have considering it's more multiplayer focused and even more custom map focused, we'll say. So the, the bloat is a serious concern for me and maybe even more so than the graphics, especially if you give me the option to use the old one anyway, uh, then maybe it doesn't matter. But if I have to bloat my hard drive with, you know, four gigabytes of a skin pack that I'm not using in the case of Starcraft Remastered, then I'm obviously not going to be very happy as a consumer. Yeah, exactly. Like I would say that it's, this is not something that I think is stri strictly related to the masters, but I think a lot of new games in general have very terrible performance. So, and very high system requirements for no apparent reason. But, uh, I, I mean, you can, you look at a very well-known example like Call of Duty, where the game is, like, twice as big as it should be just because they don't fucking know how to optimize it in any way, shape, or form. Yes, I yeah. think they have, like, entire copies of maps just because they don't know how to switch between, like, a few things on the fly. <laughs> I don't know the exact details, yeah. but that really tells you everything. If you think about it. Well, what it, what it really so, tells me is I'm not even surprised that I would not be surprised if that was real. And that really should surprise me and shock me to my core. But instead, I'm just like, yeah, that sounds about that sounds like the games industry. <laughs> yep. And uh, remasters in that sense, a lot of them have suffered from performance problems. But uh, personally, I haven't really experienced many myself. Mostly the big difference between the new ones and the originals. Although the originals obviously were meant to run on much, much weaker hardware, the main difference that I've personally experienced is the load times are significantly higher. Whereas a, like a Brood War map loads in, what, one second, two seconds? Yeah, there's almost uh, no delay at all. The, the first map that I launched in Age of Empires 2 Definitive Edition, for example, it takes up to 30 seconds or more to actually load. It's a lot quicker after that, because I guess the, the game loads into memory a lot of the data it needs. But still, that's the main difference I've personally experienced. But I know that a lot of people have uh, had significant um, performance issues on some of these games. I guess maybe they were uh, just running, I don't know, niche hardware. I guess the game was not tested very well on every single type of hardware. Yeah, yeah. Most but likely. at least it seems that with some patches, the performance have, has been improved for many people. So, again, like I said earlier, I think many games... Um, like, for example, Command & Conquer and Red Alert, uh, if you recall when you actually played them years ago, they were pretty hard to set up. Like, some yeah, of yeah. them would a bit not of run properly. So I, I can totally see why they would want to uh, make update the game to like modern operating systems and make it much easier to play and add some quality of life improve, improvements. I, I can totally understand that. But um, the problem is that when you get a situation like Warcraft 3 Reforged, for example, where you don't even make the original game freeware, which at the very least, uh, like the Command and & Conquer and even the StarCraft Remasters did, so if you don't want to pay for the fucking shitty cardboard skin pack, which is actually a separate uh, purchase, believe it or not, <laughs> uh, you can actually just download the original for free and play it. So at least something good came out of the StarCraft Remaster in that sense. 
Whereas uh, you cannot say the same for uh, Warcraft 3 Reforged, and you couldn't say the same for Diablo 2 Resurrected, I don't think either. I don't know how well Diablo 2 runs on modern PCs. I don't think Warcraft 3 runs too badly, so hopefully it's the same story for uh, Diablo 2. Even StarCraft 1 doesn't run too badly, although most people use uh, like a, a bunch of plugins nowadays, right? Like the Windowed Mode 1 and uh, a bunch yeah. of others. Uh, I think um, the original version of the game doesn't run so well anymore either. Like the full screen version. I remember there being a lot of visual glitches and stuff with the water. So yeah, I think um, again it, it's a noble, like it's a noble thing to take games, make the original freeware, and offer a new updated version with like remastered graphics and uh, updated interfaces and stuff. As long as you make the original freeware and as long as you make the original code open source. For example. Uh, well, Command and Conquer and Alert, as mentioned, were actually made open source, so you can actually reuse the code for whatever you want. And if you you just need to own the original files if you want to use the remastered assets, because the original game assets are free, so you can use those if you want. You don't need to buy the game for those, which is completely fine in my opinion. It was released like what last year, so it's not really like they're they're asking you to pay for stuff that's very old, like it's yeah, yeah, literally sure. stuff they released last year. So I'm fine with that approach. With the original assets being free and the remastered ones being, uh, you know, like something that you have to purchase if you want to use it in your projects. And I think they basically made the entire code for open source, from what I understand. They left out a few minor things like uh, the original source code for the original video format of the game engine from it's 95. Yeah, it's probably not theirs. Yeah, it's probably a yeah. proprietary reason. Well, uh, either way, it's not even a format they're using anymore because obviously they're using a modern. Uh, uh, video format for the cutscenes in the game now. But uh, that format was actually reverse engineered years ago by a project called Chrono Shift, I believe. So they were actually able to just uh, inject, like just basically merge the reverse engineered code with the code provided by the master game, and it would just work with the original cutscenes as well. So uh, even yeah. the, the few things that were not provided with the actual source for understandable reasons, like the video format, are actually, you know, like usable in this case because they reverse engineered the original a while ago and it just works with the code, right? You just can do whatever you want. Whereas, unfortunately, that's just not the case with Diablo and Warcraft 3. That, that's really the sticking point to me. Like, you don't really, you, you don't really help the communities that way. Especially a game like Warcraft 3, like, as, you, as I mentioned, you try to do stuff with it. I tried to do stuff with it years ago. I remember one thing I tried to do was um, basically I was trying to remake Warcraft 2 a long time ago. This must have been like 2010. And uh, I remember I tried to basically get workers in the water and I tried to get them to return resources to, at the docks. But um, instead, they would automatically return resources at whatever town center was built last. So if the dock was the last building built, that is where they would return the resources. But I, if I built a build town center on land, wherever it was, they would attempt to return the resources over there, and they would just get stuck because they cannot go on land. Yeah. So that just tells you there was no way to fix that at all. Also, so it's just fucked. And that is something that people could fix if they provided the source for for the original, and they just wanted to make their new assets uh, commercial instead. But that's not what happened at all. They instead tried to erase the original. In fact, that's what they tried to do, as I recall, because they edited the uh, user terms, I believe, and they also automatically updated the original to use the remaster patch, if I'm not mistaken. Wow. At least they didn't do that for StarCraft. Holy shit. I don't think they really could. I mean, they did shut down the old Battle.net servers, but for a while people were using third-party stuff anyway. So uh, you would get like a notice that says like uh, your version is out of date or whatever, but like... It's using a completely different um, web app to get you the latest version of the remaster for StarCraft. So there was no way for them to to make that bridge normally. Um, yeah, I, I would say... So, like, the, the biggest thing is... Uh, one thing we haven't really discussed too much that I guess the Age of Empires remasters also had is uh, is content. Because obviously it's one thing to, to provide the tools necessary for the community to make content. Open source, giving the assets out, making the original game freeware, that sort of stuff. Uh, that's great. And obviously the longer your game continues to last, usually through custom content and, and community support, the sort of grassroots stuff, 
Um, the longer your game lasts like that, the more sales you're going to get, the more playtime you're going to get. So like really by all metrics, um, it's actually quite short-sighted to not allow modding and similar things. However, that being said, you still obviously have the, the problem of um, not necessarily having much first-party content in any of these. And especially that problem gets exacerbated when you don't facilitate high quality or in-depth custom content opportunities. So when you don't release the source code, when you do deliberately obfuscate stuff, like in the StarCraft Remasters case, when you break everything, like every patch, like in both StarCraft and Warcraft's remaster, uh, when for a couple of patches of the Warcraft remaster, you couldn't even launch the fucking editor in the first place. <laughs> like when stuff like this happens at a fairly regular pace, it, I think it becomes clear that y you... There's a, the onus is then on the first party developer entirely to produce content that will capture the minds and imaginations of players. And of course, Blizzard themselves don't do this. They seemingly don't even bother outsourcing the actual gameplay design stuff to these companies because obviously there were supposed to be those remastered cutscenes in Reforged and they didn't end up happening. Instead, they I had think the, only the one, one with me. Yeah, they, they had the one for BlizzCon and then never did anything else after that. So uh, obviously pretty goofy. So I, I would say when it comes to the point of... Essentially, when it comes to the idea of providing a like a, a remaster of any scale of any component of any any product you have to decide what you're actually going to do if it is just a, going to be a, a, a graphical overhaul and it's not going to be a ridiculous performance grab uh, in that respect for hardware and stuff then it has to obviously be more on the free side right it has to be like we'll, what we'll do is we'll we'll give you a, a small cost upfront cost for the game um and you what you can do is uh like what you get from it is like obviously the updated graphics and modern operating system support and it's easier to install the game and play with friends and all the all of those things but blizzard is charging like 30 40 bucks for this diablo 2 shit i think this is the same cost for warcraft 3 reforged like that's almost like that's half the cost of a triple a title uh or, or a full release title or whatever so that, that's not what like the the price point entails a higher degree of, of content and quality to the experience than what they provide, especially since they outsourced all this shit anyway. So it's not even like they were paying their own developers the California rates, so to speak, uh, where you obviously have to pay them a certain amount so that they can even live. And apparently Blizzard wasn't doing that anyway, considering a lot of them were sleeping in the studio. But you get the idea. Like there's there's these people who need to like it sort of goes back in a way to to talking about like the the forced labor stuff or or the un unmarked labor where you, you don't really know where exactly your iPhone came from, so to speak. That sort yeah. of thing can happen. Uh, but but to game development studios as well, when you do outsource, and the fact that they outsourced two titles, two remasters to Lemon Sky Studios, despite their really bad end result, uh, and then gumbled, like just just bungled so much technical side of things, uh, especially with the Warcraft Three one. That says it all, really. And like I, when I when I first heard the news about what they were promising for Warcraft Three, I didn't buy into the hype. Obviously, I didn't fucking pre-order the game every day like some lunatics do. But what I did do was I uh, I said, hey, I'm uh, if if Blizzard makes good on what they've written out here as the as the sort of feature list for this remaster, then. Well, they're talking about new content. They're talking about uh, not just a remaster visually, um, which even the specs behind that, they were clearly willing to re redo the proportions to make the game more uh, easy on the eyes, we'll say, less ugly um, and a little bit more grounded. Uh, they were willing to reiterate on concepts so that they could make sure that the readability was not sacrificed, especially since Warcraft 3 is already pretty unreadable by default. So you don't want to make that worse by any means. Uh, so all of these yeah. things were were willing to be done, and um, it, like according Basically, to the they knew releases, if things would have been good to do, and they didn't do them. Yep, exactly. So like there was that. There was the promise of of better content, of uh, actually updating the product. Like it, when you dis when you as a developer announce that you are going to be changing something, I I, I made this point in the D uh, Dead Space Two review. When you make a sequel to a product and you change something about the base game. That is an admission that the original content was not good enough. It's a tacit admission. It's not like in your face, but it's saying, I wanted to change this to make it better. 
Like, I believe this change makes it better, which means the old stuff wasn't up to snuff. And when Blizzard say that they're going to change the cutscenes and update the voice acting and update the visuals and all this other stuff, that should be coming from a place of uh, observing that the original content is not good enough and what we need to do is improve upon it. And they didn't make that admission with StarCraft. Uh, they they added these like StarCraft II lore pa- uh, painting shit, like comic book panels in the in the in between cutscene stuff uh, in the campaign. And they changed the portraits and st- the art style to be more like StarCraft II than StarCraft One. Uh, so they they went towards an inferior product in many respects with their art direction. And otherwise, they obviously reduced the quality of the technical side of things as well. And then there's the readability issues that come from the the new art and stuff. That all said to one side, at least they, there was not really any discussion of like, here's where things need to be improved. But with the Warcraft 3 announcement and so many things being on the docket to be changed, I thought it was clear that Blizzard was saying, we need to improve this product because it's not good enough. And that was more than I thought that they would ever say, even though they didn't say it like in no uncertain terms. That's the in- sort of idea you can get from looking at their press releases and stuff. So... I would say, for me, one of the things that I think is massively important here is to recognize when a company, like, obviously says something and then doesn't deliver. And that's obviously what Blizzard have done here with the with the reforged disaster that happened uh, and the fact, like, the refund page breaking and stuff like that. So it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's pretty, pretty hilarious that they have done that, but it's only hilarious be- to me because I'm not like somebody who was really looking forward to the content and, you know, all this other stuff. I didn't have my hopes up. I said, well, if they deliver on all this shit, then it'll be a good remaster in theory. Like that, it has all the makings of it. Uh, we'll see if that if it actually happens. It doesn't seem to have happened. It doesn't yeah. seem to have, have gone their way. Yeah. So. And like you said, this was not aimed at you, but many people were actually looking forward to it for modding reasons. And this actually takes us back to a point we raised in the previous podcast where we said that there's a lot of untapped potential in the modding stuff that people were doing for GTA V. And the same thing applies here. Like I said uh, earlier with the uh, workers on water example, yeah. that is something that could have been fixed if the game was made open source or even if they actually improved the modability of it in general which they really shouldn't do if they just make it open source because then it's a lot easier to work with it. You can just fix the code directly instead of having to use an editor to yeah. do it. Yeah, or some but, hacky plugin um, workaround. Yeah. So they, they basically just... Uh, again, it's really untapped potential that they once again decided not to bother with. They decided it wasn't worth their time. And they, I guess they, in the case of Warcraft 3, they really just... Uh, you said they they saw their product as something that should be improved, but unfortunately, I think the takeaway for Warcraft Three in particular is they saw the product as something that shouldn't resemble more World of Warcraft. Basically, yeah. they, they should made it more similar to they should make it more similar to World of Warcraft. I think that that's what they were going for. They saw the game as being different. I guess they retcon a lot of shit since they worked on World of Warcraft. So they said, okay. We'll take this game, we'll make it visually and uh, like story-wise, we'll add it more stuff as well, just to bring it in line with the uh, world of Warcraft. That's really the... That was the end goal. But they fucked up even that. Like that, That's what's impressive to me. They just... They couldn't do anything properly with that remaster. It, it just... it They wanted to do a hundred things and ended up doing nothing. So, I don't know. That's the I think, cost uh, of uh, outsourcing it, right? That's kind of the, the biggest takeaway, I think, is that Blizzard didn't care enough to do it themselves and yet wanted to proclaim that it was going to be as high quality as everything else in their catalog. <laughs> well, I guess they made good on that claim, but not in the yeah. way that they thought. Yeah, indeed. I guess in one way they were right. I think that when we look at the way that Blizzard has sort of assembled their their roster of of uh, outsourced clients or, or when they were the client to somebody who they outsourced to, that's when we see a, a really weird trend where essentially they pawn off uh, stuff that isn't as important, like the expansion packs versus the main game, which is a really weird trend. The fact that they did that for StarCraft and WarCraft 2 and the fact that they're doing that now with their remasters. it For me, again, it kind of goes back to the idea that Blizzard themselves don't have, like, they just don't want to design a game. Like, certainly not from scratch. They want to let somebody else handle that issue. 
they would prefer to to take it from a different way, I guess. That's just my initial thought anyway, is it's it's bizarre that there's seemingly no opportunity for Blizzard to actually correct the record here at this point. Like they're too way too far gone. And the way that they could change this course, the course correct, would be to produce their own remasters, to produce their own products. Um, but they haven't even really done that. Like when I was saying earlier that, you know, Blizzard themselves have not produced um, a game since Overwatch, they've also not produced content since like whatever the last World of Warcraft expansion was really because they, they didn't produce these remasters. They did some technical stuff for it and they've maintained them. But they weren't the... Maybe they did the World of Warcraft remasters. I don't know about that. Oh, know yeah, the, the original, stuff. the classic, WoW classic stuff, yeah. yeah. Maybe so... they did that, but uh, again, that's their main game by far, so it would make sense, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it also wasn't like a visual overhaul, to my knowledge. It was more like uh, just taking the, the gameplay side of things, because that's what people were missing. That is a, a yeah. really weird element too that i completely forgot about that they went in and decided you know what we need you know what players are, are craving is an old version of our game you know before we screwed everything up because to me that is what that is an admission of it's literally like there's a market for a version of our game before we fucked everything and that's kind of yep. depressing to, to admit as a as a developer i think but i guess blizzard just like money that much so they're fine with it unfortunately that's true that's just how it went. And I don't, I don't expect they'll probably do many more remasters after this. Yeah, well, I, mean, I, I would wonder what's do. even available to remaster. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know what's left. I don't think they'll go back to the older games. There's plenty of those, but I just don't think they will go back to them. And if they will, it's going to be very, very low effort projects. Like, I don't know, like... A, uh, Norse by Northwest or Lost Vikings with new graphics, but I, I don't even know if they still have the source code for those games. And I don't think they're going to remaster StarCraft 2, for example. Like I, I don't really see the point. They don't even know what to do with the main version, let alone a remaster. That is the funny part, I, too. I that, that would be funny if they actually did the same. Like Imagine if they did the same uh, treatment that they're doing to World of Warcraft with StarCraft 2. But they basically have StarCraft 2 Classic with all the previous patches, and they resurrect all the previous balance patches that the game had. Like they, they do the cycle all over again. Like that would just be insane. I, I would actually expect them to do that now, just because of how insane that sounds. I would so, not uh, be surprised if they just recycled the same shit. Yeah, because again, what, they haven't proven that they can produce uh, another product. Like. Overwatch has so much money sunken into this. If people aren't fam like, if people just think it's a casual game or whatever, then like maybe if you gauge it or grade it on that metric, it's fine. But there has been like literally millions and millions of dollars sunken into the Overwatch professional league. And that has just been a straight up disaster and is hemorrhaging viewers and sponsors and, and so on. So like they hoodwinked a bunch of people from like American football to buy in. They hoodwinked a bunch of people endemic to esports to buy in, like people like Cloud9, these big organizations. And they don't really have any money to show for it. At this like these were Overwatch League companies had like millions, I think it was $10 million, maybe more, to buy into the Overwatch League. Uh, and to get a spot and people did that. And then <laughs> again, these people are, are run by like massive amounts of money, like 10, $10 million a rounding error to them. But these people were having to, uh, in order to, to finance their operation without n losing even more money, they had to apply for the, the PPE loans, uh, from like the small business loans <laughs> for, for uh, COVID relief. And that, I think, tells you everything you need to know. Like, obviously, Jesus. they're not getting the money that they need. Maybe it was just an elaborate scam to get even more money off the top. I don't know. But I do know that it was a fucking disaster. And, uh, like, from a financial standpoint. And there isn't really longevity there. The Call of Duty League seems to be going better in that regard. But Overwatch, on, on the other hand, is just a complete shit show. So that game, as well, is a massive failure in the eyes of Blizzard, I imagine, by now. Unless they're just sort of yes manning themselves until the ship fully sinks. And uh, submerges between the ocean. So. 
Yeah, I, I would guess so. I don't really know anything about the Overwatch PvP scene, but I think it's another game that has really fallen from grace in recent years. Like people used to take it somewhat seriously, like some people anyway. It's kind of like uh, Sack Up to itself, where many people have just given up on it at this point. I think it's a similar story as that. Yeah, even Blizzard have given up on StarCraft 2 where they stopped, uh, they decided to give it an end of life type th- treatment where I think they'll still update it every now and then with like new microtransactions and shit because that makes them money. But they're not going to be adding, like doing any more balance patches, which is actually an improvement because obviously the way that they developed the game was literally just to change shit every few months without it meaning anything like Chalks has this bit where he'll literally go through like the Starcraft two wiki and he'll find like one unit that got changed like 20 times in a year and just posts yeah, like Jesus the change Christ. log or whatever. Like, yeah, that's, a, that's a mess. Yeah. Half. That's pretty funny. It would be like, if you looked at like the, the balance history for like a uh, Hydra unit or something, except this is a, a triple a development firm. And I still make less balance changes. than them. So, like, like surely like some of this shit has to stick guys you can't just fucking like add a new abilities and read like completely change the unit identity and st- like all this shit like it's crazy it's it is actually patently insane so yeah just another long list in the bulletin board of just blizzard not knowing what the fuck to do with the games basically yeah and that's when they do have complete control and not when they're uh, outsourcing it to other people so you can only imagine how uh, messy the development process must look for for something like a starcraft remastered or a warcraft 3 reforged or indeed a diablo 2 resurrected and i guess the question is still unanswered um we will have to wait until we get like some some look at at, at how it performs at the end of the day uh, but already having frame drops and official promotional content is really bad and seemingly uh won't be resolved anytime soon either right because this is something that again i believe anyway i would speculate based on what i know about engines and uh, development is that when, when you're at the point where you are releasing promotional materials things are mostly set in stone in many respects uh, even if it does say technical alpha or everything subject to change uh, that's usually just there to uh, blanket it against criticism which funnily enough has the effect of not like it, it doesn't just insulate it from criticism but most people will look at that and say oh they, they're going to change all of this stuff that i see that's wrong so i won't even mention it <laughs> which is obviously not good because you should definitely still give feedback uh, even if it does, does fall on deaf ears, because just the very fact of you writing out the comment that says this looks like shit and seems to be lagging in their recording, I hope they fix that. Even if they don't fix it, at least you yourself were a voice of reason in a dark time in in fucking internet history. Well, it's another case of wait and see, I guess. At the end of the day, I personally don't have any hopes for the product being any good, but maybe it'll surprise us again. Since it's a different company this time, maybe they actually have their shit together. Yeah. Although I guess we have also have to mention this that apparently I I don't actually know if this is something strictly related to the alpha version or if so, if it is something that will also happen in the final game. But you apparently need an online connection to play the game. Like you cannot play it if you if you like your internet is dead for the day. Right. Or yeah. I don't know if that is gonna change in the final game. Like if that is some weird uh, alpha like uh, copy protection stuff that they have. I don't know. No. But it, it, like, Starcraft Remastered, not. that's really insane. Like, Starcraft Remastered yeah. also has only online where if you don't sign into the Battle.net once every three months, I think it is. It's probably three. Um, it's some short amount of time, though. Uh, you just can't play the game anymore. It just soft locks. So it basically, yeah, like, that, there is, yeah. there's always some sort of always online DRM. And part of it is the Battle.net app itself. Um, which is how you have to run a lot of these games. Like it's basically yeah, including this one. So yeah, basically they're just fucking it up once again with this bullshit. There is a hack that people have already made about the alpha version where you can actually play it offline. But the fact that people have to do that in the first place is really insane. Just shows you again that Blizzard really doesn't care about the customer. They just care about getting as many shitty practices in the game as they possibly can, evidently. One of the things that I uh, am interested in as well is like, obviously there's uh, there's there's a pretty big push from some people at this point to again like they ha- have had their come to Jesus moment and aren't interested in participating in this fucking 
shambolic event of, uh, of Blizzard releasing a product, I guess. Um, but it, it is still one of those things that gets me about the whole ordeal is how consistently easy it seems to be to just f- make people forget. I guess we'll, we'll, we'll end on this particular topic, but it, it seems so easy for consumers to forget how fucked they got out of the last ordeal when you have Warcraft 3 Reforged. The fact that Warcraft 3 Reforged was so bad, and that was the most recent remaster, Diablo 2 remaster gets announced, and these people are just licking their chops again. Like, maybe, a lo- I'm assuming a lot of them didn't see much to do with the Warcraft 3 Reforged, but then they're not informing themselves as consumers. They're not making an informed decision. They just see, um, oh, one of the games I grew up playing is getting a remaster. I'm so excited. Um, and they don't necessarily have the, the wider context, right, of being able to say, oh, this is actually a uh, not necessarily a good thing or, or not guaranteed to be a good thing. Yep. And again, this is something we'll have to see whether people again, yeah. what the reaction will be. I know that many people after Warcraft 3 Reforged are not so willing to trust Blizzard anymore with another um, remaster, whereas other people obviously will be apologetic until the end of times, including with Warcraft 3 Reforged. So yeah. I don't know when the game is due to release at this point. Uh, let me release date. It's going to come out uh, at some point in 2021, so this year. So we'll see before Christmas, I guess. Maybe even before uh, uh, autumn. We'll see, I guess. One of the things that I'm hoping for as well is, like, there is this misconception that, um, that like, people like myself, people like you probably as well, uh, want Blizzard to like release terrible products or want any product to be bad. Um, th- th- it's a common misconception with like even film critics or whatever, where if, if you have a history of being critical uh, as a critic, funnily enough, it's almost like it's in the name, um, y- you will get kind of harangued by by people and, and said like, oh, what do you just not enjoy any movie? Do you not enjoy like like you just want yeah, every well, movie to be bad. Like that's a kind of a common like straw man or, or fallacious sort of argument. Yeah. I think we have proved the complete opposite in this yeah. podcast though, because we gave plenty of examples about how they can improve the product yeah, and yeah. how it would be better off even for people not like ourselves. Yeah. For people who like the style of game that the, the Diablo is, for people who actually want to mod Warcraft in a way that allows them to actually do stuff. Like there's again, like I said, there's plenty of untapped potential that they could have yep. targeted, but choose not to. It's really like it's not that we think they're incapable of doing a good product because they're completely incompetent. I'm sure that they know how to make a game. Otherwise, you know, why don't they work in the fucking salt mines? But they just chose not to. It's, it's literally an issue of uh, uh, basically intent in this case. Yeah, that's how I see it anyway, and that's why I don't think. Uh, again, I think it's it's a thing that's becoming increasingly increasingly common even among Blizzard fans themselves at this point. But the flaws are so obvious that many of them cannot ignore them anymore. And it's not about being like a consistently negative person. It's more about just wishing for things to be better when they aren't. Yeah. I think that's a good way to, to explain it as well because we do want like, okay, I'll say, I'll, I'll put it this way. Like, if Diablo 2 is remaster, even though I, it's not even a game I'll play. It's not even a game I'm interested in. Like, even if it was really, like, that, the best remaster had a ton of content, I wouldn't be interested in it. But I hope it's good. I hope that this Vicarious Vision studio breathes some new life into the Blizzard catalog, provides people with a quality product, and gives people their money's worth. Because that's what I hope for every product in the games industry. I hope that it's worth the money that was spent on the development of it and also on the purchase of it. So I hope that the consumer yeah. and the developer are both like getting a, a good sort of result out of their work and out of the, the exchange of, of money and stuff, especially the consumer, like particularly the consumer, like they're the ones paying the money for the product. So they should definitely be getting the better deal in that respect. Um, the problem is that Blizzard products have not been uh, good for people's money in, in quite a while. And it's irresponsible as a consumer as a, and uh, from, in my case, I guess as a, as like a pundit or whatever, as a, a uh, reviewer question mark whatever I do on this channel an analyst uh, as, as somebody who who provides this kind of commentary and as you yourself by extension who appears on this podcast with me like it would be irresponsible of us to to claim that it's a good idea to pre-order the game which obviously you said earlier you definitely don't do like make sure that you wait for reviews and then 
not not to inform your opinion as much, but just to be able to maybe watch some footage of the game and then see what what, what is objective that, yeah. that you can take from it. Like, what does it look like uh, what, based on the footage that you see in a review? Maybe watch some playthrough of somebody who already has made the purchase and wants to stream it or something. Uh, maybe that you can find some no commentary playthrough and then quickly skip through whatever you, or maybe not so quickly, depending on how, mon- how much money is at stake here. I guess it's 40 bucks. It's not pocket change. So like, look through it, see what you get, see what you can find. And in these sort of situations, come to your own conclusion as to whether or not it actually looks like it's worth the cash. The problem is that obviously like it's kind of the the elephant in the room, so to speak, when we're talking about stuff like this, we are, uh, we've probably already alienated anybody who was interested in buying Diablo two remastered or or already had pre-ordered it or something just by talking about like real facts about (laughs) Blizzard is a shitty company. So they probably aren't listening to this part, but I would just say like as a general notion, maybe something to pass on to your friends or whatever is pre-orders are obviously bad. We brought it up early, in fact, Yeah, that we recommend to wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, obviously rec- recommend not spending money on a remaster. And uh, unless you can be, it can be demonstrated that it is worth the money. Like, maybe Age of Empires 2, for example. Uh, Command & Conquer 1, as well as Red Alert 1, in theory, uh, considering it is open source. You spend money for the remaster if you want the updated graphics or you just play the fucking mods. I don't know. Like, depends on what you really want. Um, so, yeah. And they're also cheaper than the Blizzard remasters, I think. I- I would How imagine, much was Warcraft yeah. 3 Reforged? Was it 30, 40? 30, bucks? 40, something like that, yeah. Yeah, whereas uh, Age of Empires 2 and Command and Conquer Master are 20. So. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's actually what the price of uh, StarCraft Remaster was. And I think Blizzard just assumed that they could get away with more after that, especially since they're on the Blizzard forums, there were people asking them to add microtransactions to Brood War, which is pretty fucking despicable. That's a topic for another time, but... That is yeah. uh, one last indignity I will leave you with, Dynamo, to, to mull over. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Well, there you go. Is there any uh, any final words or last thoughts you wanted to part us with before we call this podcast an end? Um, I think we pretty much covered everything we needed to regarding the remaster and especially regarding all the disastrous recent, recent history with Diablo. We'll see whether um, the Diablo remaster and Diablo 4 will actually be able to compete with Path of Exile, which I think uh, new games are also coming out of that franchise. So it's basically going to be very interesting to see what will happen to the franchise, but uh, other than that, I don't really think uh, things are looking up for the franchise for now, for the Diablo yeah. franchise. Yep. So we'll see. I would concur with that, and yeah, we'll see. Maybe we'll get a, a podcast episode in a year from now or whenever this thing releases talking about how wrong we were, or maybe we'll just spend two hours talking about just like gta 5 just talking about how bad diablo 2 remastered is who knows well you'll have to stay stay subscribed and stay tuned to find out and until then um yeah i'm sure we'll be back pretty soon for yet another episode of this so keep your eyes peeled and once again dynamo thank you for joining me my pleasure see you guys soon